Hey, welcome back to Dear Baseball Gods. This week, we've got a great guest. Dave Swanson's joining me on the show, and Dave has a super unique background. So he is currently the Sunday Night Baseball K-Zone producer for ESPN, and he's been doing that since 2004 with a brief hiatus for a couple years when he was the Cleveland Indians uh, minor league rehab pitching coordinator. So he's been around for forever. He played minor league baseball as a pitcher for 11 seasons, and he's currently also a baseball academy owner in the Connecticut area. He lives very close to ESPN headquarters. So Dave, our talk today was awesome. So if you're a big baseball fan like we are, um, Dave's one of the best baseball guys. He's been around pretty much everyone in the industry. He's got a ton of great stories and just a great perspective as a former player, as a coach, as a dad, as a you know someone who works along some of the best minds in baseball. Um, so it was just a really, really fascinating talk. He's got tons of great insight. So I'm excited for you to listen here today. So without further ado, uh, check out my talk here with Dave Swanson. Hey, Dave, how's everything out there in Connecticut? You're in Connecticut, right? Near Bristol. Yeah, you bet. Yep. Thanks for having me on, Dan. It's uh, We got about seven snowflakes in the air right now as I look out the window. Only seven. Um, yeah, we got about, about seven. It's uh, <laughs> a, a, mild, a mild 27 degrees, but uh, it is what it is. We deal with it, right? Yeah. So first question I got to ask you, um, are you a lobster roll kind of guy? No, no, N- no, no, not. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm in B I'm, I'm two hours from Boston in the, in the new England area. So I'm more of a, I guess I would say I'm more of a, a pizza guy, pizza and chicken cutlets, you know, that, that route. Um, but okay. I guess that would side more with the New York end of it, but, uh, no, I I'll, I'll, that. I'll be, yeah, I mean, I'll do some clam chowder once in a while, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I miss good. uh, I miss the East Coast pizza. New York pizza is amazing. You're right in the thick of it up there, so I'm I'm jealous. You know, I grew up in Baltimore, so you know we had Maryland blue crabs, and I was exposed to lobster rolls and all that sort of you know North or uh, New England cuisine when I kind of toured around the Atlantic League, and uh, yeah, so I, I miss that stuff. But I oh, mean, you have the best pizza up there, I bet. Yeah, you, you, you really can't – honestly, we say all the time, you can't find bad pizza up here. I mean, I, I, I guess I, I shouldn't say you can find bad pizza, but it's hard It's hard to mess up pizza in this area. So. Yeah, for sure. So, Dave, you are close to ESPN headquarters, and I'm personally fascinated that you're part of the production crew and, you know, you're right in the heart of, you know, Sunday Night Baseball. So tell us a little bit about how you became – this guy with Sunday night baseball and share a little bit with our, our viewers, um, you know, how you got that job and, and what your, what your day to day is like. Sure. Uh, yeah. So, so Dan, I'm literally, I don't, I think I'm t- without traffic. I'm about 12 minutes away with traffic, maybe 17 minutes away from, from Bristol. Um, it's uh, it's an amazing place, believe it or not. I mean, it just kind of sits in the middle of nowhere. Um, but it's it's uh, you, you need you need minivans to get around the place if, if you're going on a tour or even sometimes if you're going from one end of the facility to the other you, you might need a, a to get a ride. But it's um, so I guess just to kind of take us back a little bit, it was I, I had finished playing, uh, I spent a career playing minor league baseball, and my last year was 2001, and then uh, finished up my degree. In those next couple of years and then it was 2003 that I was I started doing pitching lessons in that 2002-2003 uh, time frame and I was working with uh, this right-handed pitcher in, in upper upper Connecticut and his dad we got to know each other pretty well after about a year um, this particular guy happened to be the head guy over there at ESPN with baseball hockey and soccer and he, he legitimately, we're finishing up a lesson one day and he just said, Hey, Swanee, do you like to travel? And I said, I said, well, I'm not really a world traveler, but, but what, what do you mean, Tim? And he said, well, we've got this new technology called the K zone. We've had it for about a year and we're looking for a, uh, we're looking for a, for, you know, a, a former pitcher, a guy that played baseball, preferably pitching. And, um, and, just as I said to you the other day, then I, you know, I said, yeah, sure. And then I didn't hear from him for a couple of weeks, a couple of weeks go by, calls me up, tells me to come down to Bristol. And, um, after a few couple hours of conversation, we, we ended up, uh, agreeing on me becoming the K zone producer, which to be very honest with you, 
for the, we, we joke about all the time, the first two years, I, I, I had no clue. I had no clue what the TV side was about. Uh, and I was only there for the baseball side of it. And then just kind of, kind of along the way to learn the process of, at the time, the new technology with K-Zone. And um, it was literally like every single pitch that was thrown on a Sunday night baseball game, I would have to tell our producer in, in, our, in our ear, in our headset, K is good. K is good <laughs> or K is no good. And that was just the tracking technology because um, it's done. It's set up on the field before the game with our engineers. And um, so in any event, you know, and long story short, I, I ended up doing that job from 2004 right through 2012. Um, loved every part of it. it. It evolved to where I started meeting with the pitching coaches before the game, getting the, you know, the repertoires of each pitcher. You know, I'd have to go down on the field. Uh, and then I actually ended up doing the Monday and Wednesday games too. So it became, it became Sunday, Monday, and Wednesday, traveling to the games uh, on a Saturday, coming home on a Monday, traveling back out for the Monday or Wednesday game and coming home. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of in the air time, uh, landing, doing the game and coming home, but uh, enjoyed, enjoyed every minute of it. Um, and then in, in 2012, I was very fortunate to work with a lot of great people, but working with Terry Francona in 2012, whatever you imagine the guy to be, he's 10 times better. I mean, he's, he's, he's one of the, my favorite people I've ever met in my life. And when he got the job with the Indians, um, you know, just talking it over with my wife, we, we thought maybe there'd be an opportunity to get back into pro ball, reached out to Terry. And, um, you know, we built up enough of a relationship where he, he felt I would at least be worthy of, a, of an interview and uh, or at least a conversation and to be hopefully become an interview and, and and that's what he he connected me with front office with the Indians uh, Ross Adkins who is now over there with the Blue Jays and then uh, kind of from there I went we did some phone interviews went out to Cleveland interviewed there and then uh, I and I know that's not part of your question but it's it's kind of the interim so I, we can always come back to that but I ended up working with the Indians as the rehab pitching coordinator an assistant pitching coach with their rookie team for a couple of years. And then, uh, and then came back just too much time away from the family came back here yeah. in 2015 and I've been back at ESPN ever since where it's again, evolved. So yeah. every, I mean, everything's evolved. You just watch a game on TV. It doesn't matter where you watch, watch a game. You can see how the technology's involved evolved. And so, and now I do everything out of Bristol. I don't have to travel anymore. Um, we do the games right, right out of Bristol. They just project you as like as like a hologram in the in the in the broadcast booth. So you're yeah, just like, honestly, it's yeah, it's amazing. Our our bo- our booth over in Bristol, our our room. You walk in and and if 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 you're really not paying attention, you're sitting down for three or four hours. You you might think you're in what we call our B unit. You you might think you're in one of the trucks, out in L.A. or out in San Fran or in Chicago. It's it's set up exactly like our trucks were. Maybe a little more spacious, but uh, I mean. I'm on the headset with my producer, my ISO producer, like, like as if they're sitting next to me. That's awesome. So, yeah, yeah. So yeah, really one of the really interesting things I like talking to, to my guests about is just how they got where they got, because I think everyone's path is, you know, especially when you've, like, you have a really unique job, you know, you played baseball for forever. You also have a baseball academy, like, you know, you've done a lot of interesting things and still are. And I think a lot of times when people say, like, how did that guy get that job? Like, how did he get there? Like, what did he do? Like, I want to do that. Like, how do I do what he did? And right. I think people sometimes forget that those interpersonal connections, like, you know, you doing a good job with that guy's son, you know, as his pitching coach is what led you to ESPN. And then ESPN led you to meet Terry Francona and leave an impression on him where then you're with the Indians for a couple of years. And now here you are back with ESPN. So it's just always fascinating, like the webs that people's lives, you know, kind of weave, right? Yeah, yeah. and I, you know, and I, I, and Dan, I'm 46. I mean, I'm not a, I'm not, you know, th- this didn't all happen overnight, you know, and I, you know, I mean, we all, we all, I grew up in that era where, you know, my, I mean, every day I left the house, my, my father's words to me were use your head and work hard and good things will happen. And, and, you know, I, I just think that, I, obviously we live in a, in a world today and, and it's not bad. It's good. We, we, we want things right away. Um, we, we have great technology and information today. I don't care if it's baseball or it's music, it's dance. It doesn't matter what it is. We, we want results right away. And that's not, 
that's not reality for most. So I think for me, I just yeah. kind of, I've always been a worker. I love to work. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a seven day a week guy. I love to work. And, uh, but you're, you're right. I think that's just how, I think, I think things happen like this. If you just, you know, you can certainly have goals, but I never had a goal to become the K zone producer at ESPN. I, I never had, that wasn't, you know, my, my goal was to play in the big leagues and, you know, I, it, that didn't happen, but I was fortunate enough to play 11 years and coach professionally and, and, uh, you know, ba- baseball's, I guess, my job. It's 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 what what I do for a living, and, and uh, but it's it's only because of just, I guess, cliche maybe, but grinding, right? Just just grinding it out, and, yeah. and um, I guess you just like anything, you put yourself in position to, I guess, be successful. But um, and I love what I do, Dan. Like I love what I do. I mean, you're you're a former player. I, I I don't even have to. I, I know what your answer would be. You walk on that baseball field, there's nothing better than the smell of the grass, the dirt, smelling the popcorn up in the bleed. I mean, there's nothing for those of us that played the game, coached the game. It's it's a it's a rush being on the baseball field every single time you're out there. And, and I know you know exactly what I'm talking about. So I, I just think like, hey, if you love what you're doing, I think good things happen. But you got to be patient in this game. You got to be patient. Yeah. And I think that's yeah. one one of those things like with social media, I think it's a double edged sword. So I was just talking to uh, my business partner, Lucas, we were just uh, recording a podcast before this one. And I was explaining how and I know you're not you don't have a big presence on social media yet. I'll, we'll give out your handle here at the end. But uh, on YouTube, it's there's a really fascinating it's it's almost like an archive. So I was telling him that uh, I'm learning about YouTube and video and all this other stuff to try to like, you know, share some of my knowledge out there on the web. And when you see these people who are like YouTube sensations, right? You see someone who's like a YouTube star, they have like 20 million or 5 million, you know, people subscribe, subscribing to their channel. It's different than say like, you know, you have uh, a movie star, right? You see like Matt Damon or Ben Affleck or, you know, George Clooney, like you see these guys, but you've only ever known them as stars, right? You have no way of looking through the archive and seeing like, what was he like when he was my age? Like when he was 15, you know, like what am I doing the right things to one day, you know, be that guy or like a big leaguer? Like you don't see, you know, like there's no archive of what Greg Maddox was like, you know, as a 10 year old or as a 15 year old. Right. Right. But now uh, like with Instagram and with YouTube, a lot of these kids that have accounts today in 10 years, they'll be able to look back. You'll be able to scroll through a, a, a Cy Young winner in 10 years. Look at his Instagram from when he was a kid and be like, yeah, look at him. Like, look what this was what he was like. I could be him. Like he was just like me when he was little. Right. Probably not right. exactly like most kids, but um, and like with YouTube, it's the same thing. If you look at one of these people that have 10 million subscribers, if you just click to sort their videos from oldest to newest, you go back and you see their first video ever, like their first video when they had no one following them, when they were a nobody and it had terrible video, terrible audio quality, doing something that they're probably not doing today. Maybe it was a complete flop, but what did they do? They stuck with it. And like a thousand later, they're this like internet famous person that makes a lot of money, that reaches a lot of people that's living the life that they want. And uh, that's, I think, an interesting side effect of the internet that, you know, whether it's a good or bad, there's going to be a record of people and what they started out with. And as they go forward, because like you said, you know, when you were a kid, like you wanted to be a major leaguer, but chipping away at it slowly was how you get there. Right. And sometimes you lose track of that. You just want to be an overnight success and no one's really like that. Well, you got, you, you've got, I mean, what, what, what are, I say, what do they say, but what is it, Dan, like three or five, three or five percent, of baseball players or football players are, are the, what we call the superstars, the Ken Griffey juniors who can legitimately walk on the field and they're going to be the best no matter what they do. They just, they got it. Whatever the, it is, they got it. Yeah. Um, but then the, the, the majority of us are the Josh Tomlins. I mean, Josh, you know, I, I tell I talk about Josh. If, if for those that don't know who Josh is, he's, he's a 10 year big league veteran. He's a right-hander who's six foot. And he's topping out at 88, 89 miles an hour. And yeah, when he misses location, the ball gets deposited in the, the bleachers. <laughs> but, but he is, I, if you had Terry Francona on the phone right now, other than Dustin Pedroia, he would probably say that Josh Tomlin, if not Josh first, is 
his number one guy of all time, his number one clubhouse guy of all time, his number one gamer of all time. I don't mean gamer on the on the on the uh, the video games, meaning yeah. you know, wants, you gotta be wants careful with your terminology here. Yeah. I know, I know. Um, you know, just great, great. Like Josh walks into a clubhouse, and you all know it. I I got a, you know, I love talking about Josh, but a quick quick example. My my first year with the Indians. So again, just as I was, I was re- doing the rehab, you know, the rehab side and Josh was, I think he was the first big leaguer that I had, that I worked with. He was coming off uh, Tommy John. And from the minute I met him, I, I just, I love him. We, we just, we talked baseball, like his day, his day would end, his rehab day would end. And where a lot of guys might be like, see you later, they're taking it to the house. Josh just wanted to hang and talk baseball. He never, he, he never wanted to stop talking the game and just learning and complete growth mindset just wanted to learn as much as he could appreciated everybody that he was around and i remember when he got back on the mound for the first time out in arizona which are where he was rehabbing his arm it was his day to pitch so he was going to throw a side session and he comes out to the bullpen now most you you can imagine how hot it is out there right all the time it's the middle of the day he comes out in his full uniform Game top, everything. And I said, Josh, I said, hey, man, you, you know, if you don't want, you don't have to wear your game top. You could just wear the, you know, the Indians T-shirt if you want. He goes, Swanee, no shot. He goes, I want to know exactly what it's going to feel like. So when I get back to Cleveland in a few months, I want to know what it's going to feel like to wear that game top. Because when I get back to Cleveland, I'm not going to be wearing a T-shirt. I'm going to be wearing my game top. So every, every single time. And then, of course, what did all the minor league guys do? When they got on the bump, they started following and doing what Josh did. So it, it's, you know, maybe that doesn't mean a lot to a lot of people, but those are the little things. That's one of the many little things that make Josh Tomlin a big leaguer. Like, yeah. attention to detail, but this guy throws 88 miles an hour and he's in the big leagues and he's a six foot righty. You know, he told me, he's a Swanee, I got, I got no business being in the big leagues if we look at numbers and stats and data, but that's the whole adage, you know, you, you can't measure the heart, but that's, that's what it is. And what, you know, I know he's a free agent right now and wh- wherever Josh's career goes now, but th- there's, there's nobody that I'm more proud to have known as a professional than that guy. He's, he's, he's got it. That to me, that guy's got it. And he grinded and he's patient. He's battled through injuries, but he's, 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 that's a big leaguer. That's the definition of a big leaguer right there. That guy to me. Yeah. And, and I, I think that's a great story because I think too many young players, they don't get this. And you work with young kids, you know, for a living like I do, and they just don't see the value or sometimes they just need to be shown the way of like how all those little details aggregate, you know, they aggregate over time to become like the reason that one guy's a Cy Young winner and one guy's an average pitcher and one guy's a major leaguer and one guy's a triple A pitcher and one guy's a minor leaguer and one guy doesn't get drafted, right? It, like everyone's... I mean, you could speak to this more than I, but I mean, everyone in the minor leagues, they have like the physical tools, right? Would you agree with that? Everybody, anybody that plays professional baseball can, can play in a big league game. Every single player in pro ball, you could put them in a big league game and they could have success. But is it, is it long-term success? Is it success for how long? Yeah. Right. Yeah, and that was, I think, a realization for me at the end of my career where I knew that there were, like, little blips on my path where I could, like, hold my own at the big league level. Like, I believe that. But I knew that I wasn't like the other guys where I could do that every day. You know, I just, I I wasn't consistent enough. I couldn't throw my curveball for strikes enough. Like, I knew that it wasn't good enough to just be like, oh, I could have one good inning and punch out two guys in the majors. Like, that's not what it right. is to be a major leaguer. Like, it's just not. Right. It's, right. can you do that every day and consistently get guys out, consistently be healthy enough to pitch, consistently, like, all, it's it's consistency. And, I mean, you coach travel baseball, so you know, like, you'd rather put the kid out there at shortstop who's going to make every routine play like you can count on him rather than he makes a stud play in the, in the, in the corner that, you know, deep in the three, uh, the, five, six hole that no one else can make, but then he boots a routine ground ball. Right. 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 And it's uh, yeah. and it's a tough mindset, I think, to build with kids that like that stuff is really valuable and that the flashy stuff maybe doesn't, it's not as important. I mean, it's, 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 it's nice. Well, I, you know, I grew up here in New England. I grew up, you know, with the shortstop for the Yankees was a guy named Bucky Dent. And 
again, I go back to being a kid and I can remember my dad saying to me all the time, this guy right here, Dave, makes the routine play every single time. Bucky Dent may have not have made the flashy play, which didn't mean he didn't, but he it didn't matter. He made the routine play every time. Just what you just said, Dan, relying on a guy, knowing that as a pitcher, knowing as a defense, as a manager, that you can put that guy out there every day and he's going to make the routine play does I mean wonders for a, ball, a baseball team. I mean, you know, yeah. it's, you know, that's, that's Pedroia. Pedroia, I mean, yeah, he'll make a sliding play to his left. You know, that play we see him make to his left where he slides on the outfield grass. Of course. But Dustin Pedroia, routine play every time. I mean, you, you, it's, you, you don't even think – you can't even remember him making errors. He made the routine play. Yeah. And I think people but, will lose track of what a routine play is too because a routine play isn't necessarily an easy play either. But, no. you know, I'm telling kids, I'm like, look, think about how many balls – don't leave the infield grass that take that weird tricky hop that a guy's running full speed at. He has to backhand it, throw it a weird arm angle and get the guy out. And they make that play literally every time. Like yep. that's a routine play and that's not an easy play, but they make that play right. every time because as a pitcher, when you get weak contact, like that play ha- that has to be an out, you know, like yep. out is outs are so valuable. And if that ball doesn't leave the infield, it has to be an out. And that's what you and I both mean by the routine play. And that's what right. I think people that's lost in translation a lot of times. And I know you probably marvel that because you played at a higher level. I did that. Like how good, like even like good minor league guys are at the infield. I mean, they, they're just incredible at tracking down bloopers and just getting to everything. One of, one of the, one of the best shortstops that I, that, you know, I played with in my time, his name was Guillermo Moda. Uh, he was my shortstop in 95 in the South Atlantic League he ended up he ended up getting to the big leagues as a pitcher with the Montreal Expos yeah i remember like that his, he was he was that good at shortstop now he obviously he couldn't hit enough to be a big leaguer but he had great arm strength and made every play long and next thing you know he's in the big leagues with the Expos i think they rule fived him he's in the big leagues with the Expos and had a long career in the big leagues uh, I think even at a home run in his first big league at bat, but you know, it's, um, Hey, you know, baseball, baseball allows us, Dan, it allows patience. And if you can hang in there, because here's, what's great about baseball. You don't have to be the biggest, you don't have to be the fastest, you don't have to be the strongest. All those things certainly are beneficial, but you, you, you got time. I mean, how many, how many, how many ball players don't hit that growth spurt? until they're 14 or 15 years old. And, and if, and if, if you're playing football, that might not work. If yeah. you're playing hockey, that might not work, you know, um, basketball may not work, but baseball allows baseball allows for a little bit of time there for you to develop your skills. And then when you grow, you got a shot, yeah. but um, it's a great game, man. It's in the, you know, this game's honestly, you know, like what, what, you know, what is it? Listen, we're all competitive. Everybody's competitive. People talk about, I'm competitive. I'm Mikey. I'm competitive. Well, everybody's competitive. That's why we play sports. But I think baseball, more than any other sport, it, it really is about the relationships. I mean, think, you know, you're at the professional level, you're with guys 250 days out of the year, you're with your teammates or your coaches. Uh, minor leagues, almost the same amount of days. You know, when you're in college, if you're not, if it's not your, your season, which might be 70 games, you're with those guys all the time, except when you're home in the summer uh, and for break. Even in high school, I mean, now you're so baseball is a, you're you're with each other almost every day, and it really is. It's about it's about the friends you meet. That I mean, you know, Dan, you probably run into guys ten years later, out of nowhere, a guy you played with ten years previous, and it was like you were with him yesterday, and yeah. and, and that's what what's great about the game. You you can run into baseball people all the time, whether you go to events, um. And everybody's got to kind of got that common language and it's, it's, it's just easy to talk to, to people that are involved in the game of baseball. Yeah. It's, it's funny you mentioned that because, uh, my next guest, uh, a guy named Pete Mackey, I don't know if you know Pete, yeah. but he, I mean, uh, he's one of the Minnesota twins pitching coordinator from the minor leagues. And we were talking on the phone, uh, like two days ago in prep for this, for our podcast. And he, we have a mutual acquaintance, uh, my friend, Zach, who Zach and I, we were teammates at UMBC, Maryland, Baltimore County, my small division one that I went to. 
and then Zach and I were teammates later and, and Pro Bowl at the tail end of both our careers. And uh, Pete mentioned him because he was going through the podcast episodes, and he's like, yeah, like, I didn't know you knew Zach. And they had played together for one summer for really like a month or two in the Cape Cod League in college. And then yep. he said he hadn't seen Zach, uh, I think, in like 14 years. And then they connected because Zach is now a, a scout. They connected at a perfect game event, and it was like 14 or 16 years later. And they just like, hey, like we used to play together. Like, it's, like the baseball world is crazy small. And it's just yeah. you're always within like a couple degrees of somebody you played with or you knew. And it's it's funny how that's like the first conversation when there's a you know spring training, a whole group of new guys. Everyone's like, oh, where'd you play? Oh, I played here. Oh, did you play with him? Oh, yeah, I played with him. Like he played with my buddy here. And it's just it's crazy how you know everybody. It, it, it well, and in our sport too is, you know, we're 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 spread outside of uh, you know outside of the United States too. I uh, you know like my so I I in in that same year in '95 when I was with Guillermo, I played also as teammates with Jesus Sanchez from the Dominican lefty pitcher. Yeah, Jesus ended up getting to the big leagues. Uh, I think he's got about seven years in the big leagues. Um, so I, I get hired by the Indians. I'm in spring training. It's March 2013. I walk into the coach's office, and I hear, "Swanee," and I look to, and it's Jesus, and and he's he's a he's a pitching coach, in in the Indian system, in, over in the Dominican. His son, uh, I, I think his son's still in the system, but his son was a prospect in the system too. And like you just said, not to beat it down, but like like we were together yesterday. This is yeah. 18 years later. And here we are get together again, coaching together, and it's uh, it, it's pretty cool, man. It it really is. So, so you touched on a term that I like to I like to get other opinions on. What does the term grinding mean to you? Because I think it's a personal term. Like I think everyone's definition is a little bit different. I think it's a uh, a little more consistent across guys that have played at a high level. But what does grinding mean to Dave Swanson? You know, I, I, honestly, it grinding it out just means having a plan, waking up every day. Because you, you know, Dan, and for the people listening right now, this game of baseball can confuse us quickly. This game will speed up on all of us. You know, we expect, you know, our kids to go out there and what? What are you doing? Why? I, how did you not know where to go on the field? Because when we're out there playing, the game gets really fast. And I just think for for young kids and for coaches. For dads, and I'm I'm giving myself the advice. I just think if we have a plan every day, that's that to me that's grinding. You know, you want you you go into a, a practice, you go into a baseball lesson, a, whatever you do every day in the game of baseball. If you go into it trying to accomplish 13 different things, you're going to get nothing done. So I think if you go in each day with one or two focuses. And you may not even get either one of them done. But if you go into it, I just think it helps clear your mind. Um, and it allows you to grind. It allows you to get after it with that particular focus area. Um, you know, on the pitching side, I'm just making this up. Maybe it's your lead arm. Maybe it's your hip shoulder separation. Maybe it's maybe it's just feeling the ball come out of your hand, you know, with your change up and, and trying to get the ball to fade and run. Whatever it may be. Um, I don't care if it's your throwing program. You know, that's the other thing too. Be good at your throwing program. If you want to be a good pitcher, you got to throw the you got to be able to play catch the right way every day. But um and just believe in, man. I mean, what does baseball do to us? Now on the, on the negative side, what does baseball do to us more than any other sport? It makes us want to quit. Baseball <laughs> yeah. makes right? Baseball baseball is a sport where you go you come up the first at bat, you strike out. You got to you got to hang out for about a half an hour before you get up again. You shoot a three pointer and miss, that ball might come right back to you. You know, you 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 get you, you're you're a, 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 a running back in the NFL and you get tackled for a three yard loss. You might get the ball the very next play. Baseball, <laughs> baseball tests you mentally, right? Yeah. Your mindset and and it doesn't. So you know, again, we I I could talk for an hour about what grinding means, but because it, it means so many different things, but it just it's have you. I, I, I just urge people to be positive, man. It, it, it makes us want to be negative. Listen, I'm guilty of it myself. I mean, you know, we have these expectations. We think it should be that easy. This, this game is, tr is extremely hard to play, but not so much the physical part, just because it just it wears you down with your mind. 
and it makes us believe that we can't. So, yeah, the truth is the best hitters can't seven out of ten times. The, the best. So have an open mind, be positive, have a focus, and work. You got to work, though. You got to work. A baseball lesson once a week, not getting it done. Yeah. It, it's not, you know, for all the moms and dads out there, I mean, I'm – and, Dan, I'm going to be honest with you. Like, I tell people all the time, I'm not a big – I used to be a, 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 a single student lesson guy. I, I, I don't really, you know, on the pitching side of it, I, I've, I've kind of worked away from that because, you know, you know this as a former pitcher. How many times are pitchers in professional baseball, in college baseball, even in high school baseball, how many times is a pitcher really alone? Okay, we can argue and say, well, you know, in spring training, there's early work, you know, your, your name might be up on the board. You might be. You might head out to the bullpen with your pitching coach for 20 minutes. Yeah, no, no doubt. There's going to be some time where you are alone with your pitching coach, but for the most part, pitchers are in groups. Yeah. You're, you're 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 with a group. You're with a group of guys. Whether it's PFP, film study, bullpens. I mean, you know, most of the time you're with other guys. And and I'm just my my mind person. I'm starting to change the way I think on that. And I still think the one on one is is beneficial, but. I like the idea of guys, two kids, two or two or three kids together at once because they can feed off each other. They're going to compete even though they're not competing. They're going to, you know, I, I don't know. I just, um, you know, I know I'm getting off on a tangent, but I, I just, I guess grinding is just, just kind of circle back. Grinding is just having a plan and seeing it through and yeah. not, not quit. You know? Yeah, no, and I, I agree with you. And I think, you know, it's it's easy to get out of that mindset where oh I just need my pitching coach, um, but you learn so much from other players, especially at higher levels in college, uh, and in pro ball especially. Like so much of your education comes from watching other guys. So when you're in that group setting, you just get to see like hey ha- how do you hold your change up? Like hey why is your slider that sharp? Like what do you think of my slider? You know like there's so much just like watching and like you said like observing Josh Tomlin. You know, that doesn't happen if everyone's one-on-one with you, right? Those other guys saw him, and they get to, to learn those, like, oh, why does he do it that way? Well, he's better than me, so maybe I'll give that a shot. So I, I think there's a lot, I think there's Sorry, a lot of merit there. Hey, we got, we got dogs. It, it happens. But, uh, but yeah, so I, I, I think that's, that's valid. And, I mean, you know, with having a plan – I think it's really easy for players to not be present. I was talking with one of my pitchers last night about this, that I was like, look, man, like, you know, you're going through your drills and, you know, me as your coach, I could be just catching the ball from you and throwing it back, but I'm watching you and I'm watching the spin. I'm watching everything about every pitch you throw to me. Like I'm present here for every throw you make to me so that I can give you feedback. But are you present? Are you mentally there on every throw that you make? Like, where's your body in space? Where was your front arm? Where, how did it release out of your hand? Like, what was your spin like? Like, are you there and present for every rep that you take? And a lot of kids aren't. And that's where I think it comes back to what you said, having a plan. If they're like, okay, I'm here today to work on this. And I'm going to be present in, of mind for every throw I make, every swing I take, because I'm going to get better at this thing today. That, when you aggregate that over time, like, that, that makes you a guy, right? Yes, and you know, it, you 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 you're making me think of a guy named. So you remember the name Matt Caps? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Close, closer in the big leagues for uh, well, he he was a closer with the um, actually an all star with the with the Nats, and uh, Matty was I worked with him in 2014. He was rehabbing his shoulder, and same thing. I mean, just again, you you find out why these guys are big leaguers really fast. You find out what separates them really fast. So Matt, when, when you play catch with a guy like Matt Caps, he could be at 40 feet, he could be at 250 feet. He is trying to hit the same spot every single time he's been doing it since he got into pro ball. Ray Searage, one of the great pitching coaches in baseball right now, was Matt's guy when he came up with the Pirates. And, you know, we kind of go back to talking about what you're talking about, having a plan, playing catch the right way. Every, if, if Matt was playing, he's since retired, but if he was playing catch with you right now, he would try to hit. He was a, he was a righty pitcher. He locate. He looked at your left. I mean, I'm sorry. He looked at your right hip. So he would always look at his throwing partner's right hip, right below the waistline, and he would try to dot up on that one area every time. You know, the 
the, 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 the aim small, miss small. But play catch with Matt blew, blew my mind. Like, it just blew my mind because I could literally just put my glove. It didn't matter what the distance was. I could just set my glove. I could take my glove off, tie it to my belt loop on my right hip, and he, and he would probably come within two or three inches of it every time. So when you flick the TV on at night and it's 945 and he's coming in to close a game in those stressful moments, facing great hitters like Albert Pujols and guys like that, that's part of the that's that's a big part of the reason he can dot up right there and locate that fastball to his glove side. But it just, you know, it, it's 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 amazing to see what these guys can do, but you understand why they can do it because their attention to detail. And I'm gonna tell you something, they don't take big leaguers, they don't take one throw off. You know, I'm sure you see it all the time. You watch you can go out and watch a high school team throw. You're gonna see kids talking to each other and just kind of go. Those these guys do not take a throw off. They they don't. It's it's too important to them. Yeah, they may they may talk a little bit, but every throw these guys make matters. Like yeah. you see it, you know. That's where I wish during spring training, people that go watch spring training, I, I wish they'd be allowed to go down to the backfields and just watch guys just play catch or just or, or that's what I would tell you know, parents and young kids to do, go watch these guys play catch. Go watch a major league pitcher play catch. It's, uh, it's something to see. And, and don't get me wrong. They're not perfect. And they're, they're going to, you might see them, but these guys are locked in. They're locked in. Cor- yeah. uh, you know, Corey Kluber, obviously, and guys like that. But um, attention to detail, man, it's huge. Yeah. So let's double back. I want to talk about, we got two other big things I think we both want to cover, which is, we're going to talk about some arm action stuff and some of the reports that you write because um, you sent me a couple, one on John Lester, one on Joe Kelly, and they're, they're fascinating. So I want to get into those. And then I let's but let's get there through some more of your K-Zone, your ESPN experiences. So walk me through a day in the booth or just a day, you know, your day to day as the K-Zone producer, because you talked about. You know, we got to set up this stuff up before the game on the field. Like, what does that look like? like you have some sort of projector that's like, tell me about a little bit about the technology and then tell me about what you do. Because I know, but I want our, 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 our audience, because it took me a little bit to understand, you know, what your role is and how you support Alex Rodriguez and all those guys in the, and, and, and girls in the booth. So hook me up with the, uh, what it's like to be Dave Swanson in the, the ESPN booth. All right. Well, I mean, just I'll just kind of like I said, I, I I do Monday and Wednesday games as well. Um, but you know, just you know, just to kind of we'll, we'll focus on the Sunday night, the the week. Um, okay. Two, Thursday is our is our usually our conference call. Every Thursday noontime we get on our conference call. So that's everybody that's involved with our production. You know, our producer, our what we call our ISO producer, which is kind of like your assistant coach, your director. The, the on-air talent, which would be Matt Vaskersian and Alex and Jessica, and um, and then a lot of us that are involved in in the part the, the part of the game, you know, part part of the production. So for me, it's honestly just the baseball side, you know. And and I say this in all sincerity, the people that are really smart, that's not me. Those are the people that are to my left and right inside inside our room. So there is there the the person who sits to my left. That's, that's called our EVS operator. And if you're just thinking about a turnstile, it's a, it's a, it's a metal box, which has a little dial on it. And whether you know, I've, there's two or three different uh, operators that I work with throughout the course of the year, if, if I need to see a pitch, if it's the fifth inning and I, and I really need to see a pitch from the second inning from Madison Bumgarner, I can ask our EVS operator, hey, second pitch to Bumgarner. Uh, I mean, second pitch to um, just Justin Turner in the second inning from Bumgarner when I see it. And literally within five seconds, if not less, they can pull that pitch up. And if it's a pitch that we want to put into a potential replay package, they will clip it off. And that will be the beginning of one of our replay sequences. And just to give an example, if you watch our games next year and you see them, you're going to see Pitcher replay packages of anywhere from five to six pitches. You won't see us. You won't see a replay of. Well, you won't too often see a replay of 
you know, Clayton Kershaw getting a guy out or getting uh, five to uh, eight, eight different guys out, you're going to see a replay package of him maybe using his curveball throughout the f- course of five innings, getting five for six different hitters out mm-hmm. um, because of time constraints. Usually our replay package is going to take 15 seconds, but, um, but yeah, I, so I, I know I'm jumping ahead, but on that conference call, which usually it's about an hour, hour and a half, you know, we just talk about the upcoming game. And then for my, my part on that call is just to, you know, talk, and, and give my, my thoughts on, on what I might know or see from our starting pitchers for that Sunday night. And I'll talk a little bit about what we might see from them mechanically, um, their stuff, their tendencies, and then what I do, Dan, and then from there, I end up I, I put it about three or four hours into each pitcher um, from there uh, up until Saturday, and I try to get the reports to the on-air talent and our production staff by Saturday. I know that's sometimes too late, but it – it's something that I take pretty serious and, and I want to do right. So, and it's not as simple as cut and pasting. Like we have, we've had John Lester so many times, but I still go back and, and, and watch and see if he's changed things, um, you know, from, from start to start. I mean, you know, the last couple of years, he's, he's, he'll add that change up in a little bit more. We know he's a big cutter guy, but you know, we see more change up usage now from him. And um, so the reports are always changing. Um, but it's it's fun. So I basically I'll go back and watch video of these guys, and and I'm fortunate to have relationships with you know a bunch of the pitching coaches that we you know that have been around now for years, where I've gotten to know a couple of these guys, and you know I, I you know able to talk to them on the phone about about their you know their guys, and and uh, and try to find out the real truth instead of what I'm just thinking I'm seeing on video. Um, you know, so from there we'll, we'll put a, we'll, we'll put a, I'll put a report together and I'll just break it down. What, what my take is on the pitcher. I'll give a repertoire. I'll put together, you know, their average velocities, their, their highs and lows. I'll put together, um, um, uh, you know, anything else that might be relevant, uh, strikeout rate, what they do in one, two counts, um, how good they are at holding runners or not. Um, do they work from a slide step, a load and go, or a full lift? What side of the rubber do they pitch from? You know, a lot of the things that are definitely common, you know, and, and understandable for a lot of us, but but maybe not for everybody. Um, you know, and, and this is stuff that – and what I love about Alex Rodriguez is he he really wants to hone in on the relievers. And in all my years doing this, I, I've never had um, anybody ask me for the relievers. And he wants – to know the relievers. So I don't, obviously time-wise, I don't have time to do a full report, but I think I sent you uh, uh, maybe one of, the, one of the reports, or maybe the Cubs I might have sent you, but mm-hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll every, for every Sunday, I'll go back and do a, like a mini bio on each reliever, and that's for Alex, and, and that, that, that impressed me. Like, he, he's prepared, man. <laughs> he's, yeah. he's prepared. Well, and, and Jessica Mendoza, she uh, she spoke at Saber Seminar this year, which is a baseball oh. analytics conference in Boston. Yep. And and she one of the things that really stuck out with her talk was just how mu- a much she just loves baseball and softball. But she just like just talking about how she just like gets geeked out. She used that that phrase a bunch just about learning all these different things. And as I've looked through your reports, I can see how she with just like, you know, her passion for baseball just oozing out in her talk how she would just like love seeing these, like, you know, here's cutter average 84 or 87.4, you know, uses it 24.42% of the time, like all this stuff. So I could see how, you know, she would just like eat up your reports and how she just talked about how much, you know, everyone in the booth just prepares and prepares and prepares to try to have all the info they can to give a really good broadcast. Right. And I, and I, I've, I've been working with Jessica since 2000. Uh, well, this, this will be, so next year will be our third and a half year. And um, she, she's awesome. I mean, honestly, energy, passion, work ethic, like yeah. no other. Mm-hmm. And listen, you know, we, I, I know what, you know, I know, you know, whatever people say, ah, she didn't play a bit. Let me tell you something. She, she, lo- you're right. She loves the game. She's willing to learn. And it's, it's great working with her because nobody works harder. Nobody works harder. And you can see it. Like you just said, yeah, she's on TV. It. Yeah. She wants to, she wants to get the bat in her hand and, and play. I mean, she just, she loves it so much. Um, 
and and she loves getting down on the field talking to the guys and and uh she's she's awesome and i, I know they just they just they're going to bring her back again next year i, I love it so it's, it's great working with her they're all they're all listen they're all great to work with because they're all highly motivated people and not many of them are closed off to learn a new thing like they're all open-minded and it's 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 just it's a good environment because people there want to uh you know w- want to talk and learn and feed off each other and i mean eduardo perez second to none man that that guy is so smart when it comes to the game of baseball he knows everybody his dad was a great baseball player i mean he he's awesome love talking to eduardo about baseball and i i mean i it would again i need another hour just to talk about him like great human being and the the baseball knowledge off the charts yeah and I see I'm looking at your list here. You've worked with Joe Morgan, Oral Hershiser, Rick Sutcliffe, Bobby Valentine, like uh, Buster Olney, uh, Tim Kirkjian. Like you've been around a lot of these people. Any other uh, I know, like you said, like these are all you can tell all these people just like love baseball. Like I personally love listening to Oral Hershiser. Like he's got so many great Me pitching too. insights. I mean, I feel like I learned a ton from him and I feel like he shared it really simply too, like in a very like, candid, like not cliche way. Like it was just really like good, like, wow, that's why that guy was so good. Like he knows, you know? Well, I remember, I remember when I was working with Oral, I was up. So this is when I was obviously traveling. I, we were, I don't know if we were in LA or wherever we were before, before the game, I went up and saw him just to kind of talk about, you know, just to kind of review the, the guys on the bump. And, and we just started talking pitching in general. And I, and I remember saying this to him, I'm like, Oral, you know, you know, when we get up into that balance point and he said, you know, very politely, just like he always is. He's like, Swanee, just remember, we don't really get a balance point. And he goes, I know, I know you and I were both taught that coming up. And now, and Dan, this is like, oh, this is probably eight years ago, maybe. I don't know. And, and, and I was like, <laughs> I was like, what? He's like, well, you know, we, our body really doesn't, for the most part, stop. And we really don't want it to when you're lifting that leg. And because then you get stuck behind the rubber and, he goes, it was just like in about a minute and a half, I, I, I was like, wow, there's some humble pie. And he, his whole thing was, <laughs> just remember, everything we do as pitchers is in front of the rubber, not behind the rubber. And and then, I of course, <laughs> I, went, I went back and I found video of oral pitching. And, and I'm like, oh, my gosh. Like, everything he just told me is exactly what I'm seeing. And that's kind of when the whole, you know, again, another topic for another time, but the whole – idea of should we even be saying balance point to kids should we be saying stay back should we i don't say those things anymore i I, when i got working with the indians that that language was wrong and um you know stay back get balanced because if you look at guys today how many guys are stopping They're, they're they're loading over the rubber and they're going man i mean so uh, but anyway, you know, just just being able to learn from from people like that, being around people like that. Joe Morgan was actually the first. Joe Morgan was the. I, so when I was first doing the job, I I was so in awe of Joe, and finally it was like after the second year, I said to my producer, I said, I said, hey, can can we, can I start like doing like like pitcher type reports and giving pitcher information? He's like, sure, go ask Joe. <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I was on the elevator with Joe, and I said, hey, Joe. I'm I'm Swanee. I, I've been working with you for a couple of years. He goes, Oh yeah, Swanee. Of course I know you. Oh yeah. I said, can we, uh, w- would it help if I like provided you like pitcher info? He goes, that would be awesome. <laughs> so without Joe Morgan telling me it would be okay, I probably, it probably wouldn't have evolved into these reports that I did to be honest with you. Cause you know, at, at, at the time, I mean, the way I thought of it was I need the okay from him. <laughs> and uh, so, but yeah, I've, I've been, I've been lucky Dan work with some great people. So you say it evolved into the pitch reports that you do now. So what was your job like at first? So you say like K zone producer, like what was it at first and, and how has it kind of changed over the years? Well, the, 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 the K zone producer part of it is, is honestly, it's, it's, it's the replay packages you see. Okay. So when you see a K zone replay on TV and you hear Alex or Jessica or some, Hey, you know, here's, 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 here's a, uh, you know, Here's Kershaw's slider tonight or his cutter, whatever the pitch may be, whatever the pitch may be. That's what it was for, for 
four or five of the first years I was doing it. Um, and, you know, just kind of looking, watching the game from, from the truck, trying to pick, pick out sequences of what these pitchers are doing. Nothing really mechanically at all. We didn't have the, you know, the, the ability to do anything with, with mechanics. Now it's, again, it's a big part of what I do is these pitcher reports, studying the pitchers, but also we have the, the person to my right. We have what we call an art, art package. You know, so now we do art packages and we have the machine that, where we can doctor it up, Dan. You know, just like the Huddle app where you can draw on or the whatever app guys use for their mm-hmm. baseball lessons. You know, we have that in the truck now. So, you know, when I, if I see something mechanically with a certain guy, like some of the stuff you see, see that I sent you, like we can do that on TV now and we do. And, and again, it's because of really intelligent people that sit to my left and right that can take the information that I'm giving them and put it into what we call an art package. And so now we, now we go to air with, you know, you might hear Jessica say here, you know, here's, here's what Jacob deGrom does with his delivery. And, you know, we might break that delivery down in two or three spots within his delivery with, with an art package. So, so now it's, it's become replay with drawings on it, you know? So it's, uh, it went from me just being in a truck looking for pitch sequences. Now it's that along with the pitcher reports and breaking, breaking things down mechanically, even hitters. We've had hit, hit, we've broken down hitters. We've compared you Darvish and Justin Turner's bodies and the way they move. We had, we did a replay package with that Jessica, we gave to Jessica a couple of years ago. She, she took to air replay. We had a side by side of Darvish and, and Justin Turner and, how similar their bodies work within Turner's swing pat, you know, swing and, and Darvish's delivery. So it, it's awesome. Yeah. It's, it's awesome. funny. It's funny you mentioned that because I'm sure you see the parallels as well, but I was also just talking about that where the lower half mechanics and the shoulder hip separation between a hit, a, you know, a hitter and a pitcher are like eerily similar. They're crazy yeah. how similar they yeah. are. And that's yeah. why, you know, all these guys that hit bombs in the majors also throw very hard right like you throw yep. bryce harper off the mound which you know he would do in high school and he throws 96 same thing with like right. nick markakis like i had a teammate who played uh back in college summer ball he's like yeah i, I came up with markakis like we played together and um the dude threw like 96 from the left side off the mound and hits yeah. dingers and super like all these guys they just know how to produce that force with their body whether it's with a ball or a bat, it's like the same thing. Like that's what's they, really unique and interesting. Yeah, and they could probably do it with a hockey stick to some with degree. Golf, and, and, golf and, club, and, yeah. Yeah. And it's listen, hey, you know, it's it's being athletic too. I mean, you know, one of the things, listen, I'm going to be honest with you, Dan, like when I do a pitching session, our day starts after we get loose with the J bands or whatever we do, we're, we're, we're throwing the football for four minutes. And then, and then the bait, and then we, and then we throw a softball for four minutes before we even throw a baseball. Now, hey, that may sound crazy to people, but there's a great article. I don't know if you've seen it. The it, it's the Tribune, the Tribune, or what? On it was on Severino a couple of years ago. Okay. And his growing up in the Dominican and how he started throwing softballs to just, and he had a coach to tell him to start throwing softballs, and his velocity went up. Now, whether you believe that his velocity went up or not, I don't even think that's the point. I think. I think what happened for Severino is by throwing softballs, I think it just made him aware of how he should be throwing. I think it helped create his arm path. Because, mm-hmm. you know, when you're a kid, listen, we've all been there. You know, you're, you're not, you really don't know what your arm path is. You're just picking up the baseball and chucking it. And um, it's a pretty good article. I'll even, I'll text it to you after here. But it, really interesting article. He's, he's the one talking in the article. So, you, you know, it, it's, um, but I got, I got buddies right now that are in pro ball and they start their day. They're pitchers. They start every day. They start by throwing a football, you know, and it's um, just being an athlete, right? I mean, being an athlete, you know, being able to throw a baseball is great, but figure out how to throw a football and a softball and a dodgeball and, you know, just be athletic. (laughs) So man, this is, you're just making these segues so easy. So, well, two things on that. So, uh, you probably have come across Brian Bannister in your work to an extent. Have you ever spoken with him? You know what? I never have. No, I, 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 I know who I, I actually, he, he came in 
what was it, two years ago, he was he was the assistant pitching coach with the Red Sox. And then when Carl Willis left to go back to the Indians, I think then Brian took over last year, right? Yeah, something like that. And he's had that unique role with the Red Sox where he's kind of like an analytics guy, but also a pitching guy. And he's just like, he blends the two together and kind of helps people trade analytics language for language that players can understand. And so he speaks also at that Sabermetrics conference, uh, Saber seminar, which was in Boston every year. And so he was there speaking last year and he always just like kills it. But one of the things he mentioned that stuck out at me and it, it hit me close to home, Dave, because I can't throw a football worth of crap. And I never could. And I never really put much effort into it because I'm not very athletic. So I never wanted to like be on a football field to <laughs> expose how unathletic I am. But he was like, he was talking about throwing a football and how guys that uh, throw sliders, how the football seems to really benefit them because the action is very similar. But he nope. also mentioned how guys that have really exceptional four seamers and very high spin rates on their four seamers and good, very good uh, spin axes on spin yep. axes on their four seamers, they suck at throwing footballs. Yep. He's, he's like, he's like, I think some of those guys, because like the reason they're so good at spinning a four seamer is also the reason that their body doesn't want to get on the side of the football to spin a football well. So I thought that yeah, was that really interesting. Sense. Yeah. 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 And uh, it just shows like there's different things because, you know, on a minor league field, like guys are throwing the football around every day, like literally every day every in pregame. Day. And I didn't every participate because mine would just be like this, this <laughs> fly, I'm, like, I'm throwing a sack of potatoes or something. <laughs> but, uh, but, but it kind of like shed some light. I'm like, okay, well, maybe I'm not <laughs> as terrible at that uh, as I think. Like maybe it's just because that's kind of like the way my hand works, right? But like you said, yeah. it's about finding your unique thing. Like for me, yeah. I was a I was a really good four seamer guy, and I had a high spin rate. Like I could just like throw ninety one down the middle, and guy would miss it. And I'm like, that's weird. Like you should have destroyed yeah, I, that. I, I <laughs> but, but yeah, but you fi- yeah you figure that out over time, and uh, and so let's talk about arm pass. So you mentioned that here. I don't know. Number one, I want you to define it for people because I'm not sure everyone knows what that means. But also, let's talk about Joe Kelly a little bit because you sent me his report, and he's a really interesting example of a guy yeah. who's really changed the way his arm works, his arm action, like the arm circle that he makes. So tell me what arm path means, and then tell me a little bit about Joe Kelly. Well, yeah, I mean, for me, arm, arm, your arm path for me is when, you know, again, the terminology, everybody's got it there, but we can say separation of our hands or what I, I call it takeaway. So when our hands take away from each other, to me, that's the beginning of your arm path, and that's pretty much, you know, the movement of your arm all the way through to release. Back in the old days, Dan, when I was coming up in 1991 to 2001, you know, it was the terminology was thumbs down, thumbs down. And that was when you separated your hand, your thumbs peeled down. I also am very proud of what I was taught. And I think for many of us that grew up in that era, in any era, we're we're very proud of what we we were taught. And it wasn't, there's no, I'm not going to sit here and say that it was wrong because it was what we were taught and it was equal across the board and it, and it just, we all figured out a way to make it work. However, in our pitching world today, that would be the term that 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 term is now being spread out, which you know doesn't allow a lot of guys to be on time. And now jumping ahead a little bit for being on time for me, Dan, is that when you're when that front foot lands, that what we call touchdown or foot plant. For me, I want to see the throwing arm in at least a 90-degree spot, if not even inside. You can look at Clemens and Maddox. Those guys are mm-hmm. – Jake Arrieta. Those guys, I mean, big leaguers itself, those guys are mostly inside of 90 degrees at touchdown. Young kids, you're going to see that they're outside of 90 degrees. And a good buddy of mine who's a shoulder surgeon, he tells me that's kind of what his – that's one of his keys. He looks for that kind of stuff you know, in, in film with young pitchers all the time, like, are they outside of that 90 degree slot? So, um, you know, for me, I like, I, I think the football, believe it or not, helps us actually create a pretty efficient arm path, you know, football uh, quarterbacks, catchers, you know, these guys, they don't get hurt. I mean, you don't see a lot of surgeries with catchers and football, not that they can't happen. And, and again, yeah, that's I- another conversation again, right? There's not as many, quarterbacks on a team as there are pitchers they're not throwing a football as violently as you're throwing a baseball velocity because it's a heavier object but those guys don't tend to have shoulder surgery and elbow surgery um, and they're pretty efficient with the way they throw so 
you know, we things that I've learned from people that have passed it on to me, and I it's, I believe in it too, is just not allowing that arm to get long, to get spread out. However, Dan, you you we could all go watch Madison Bumgarner pitch and look at video of him pitching, and he's completely spread out. So then it's like, wait, what's that Swanson guy talking about? He, he said you can't get uh, – I'm not saying you can't get spread out. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying I, I think as baseball continues to move along, I think guys that are spread out that can't control the baseball, I think those are going to be the guys that we see do what Joe Kelly did. Joe Kelly in 2012 when he came up with the Cardinals in that time frame, he was so long and spread out. He was throwing hard, zero command. Then he comes over to the Red Sox in 2000. I think when did he come over? Maybe 16 he came over. But yeah, all of a sudden, I, I'm, I was watching video of him. And I was like, oh, my gosh. His arm path is not even close to spread out. It's like what would have been called short-arming it back in the day. And uh, Joe yeah. doesn't – He doesn't, his arm is a two, his arm stays in two pieces throughout its entire path. His arm never straightens out and becomes what we call a one piece. It's two pieces, and it's always bent, just like Trevor Bauer. And, again, the, the numbers on guys that do that right now, obviously the percentages are small, but I know Joe Kelly still is can get, be erratic at times, but, you know, when you're throwing the ball 102 miles an hour, it's pretty hard to control. It's pretty hard <laughs> right. to So, you know, for, for me, I just – I really kind of honed in on that with Joe. Um and and really noticed how you know you watch Joe, and he start hey listen he's starting to figure it out he's a pretty integral part of that bullpen but completely changed his arm path went from spread out to now whatever we want to call it so I would just say that you know anybody out there that's working with you know if they're if they think their kid is short arming it you don't really need to stop that and Dan I don't know about you too but I don't I don't put a big focus on the way kids throw because everybody throws differently. Personally, I like to just build around the arm. I mean, everybody throws – I mean, how many big leaguers throw the same? Everybody throws somewhat differently. So, you know, I, I'm not a big changing anybody's arm path unless we think they're going to be a, you know, a, a potential uh, candidate for injuring themselves or if they're not commanding the baseball. But I don't know. I don't. I think you are, you are what you are. You try to make it efficient. You try to make it work. Um, yeah, and I would know, tend to and, agree. And I, I think we're on the same page in that, you know, like I've been working with a young man recently who when he came in, when he lands, his elbow is at like a 140-degree angle, right? And mm. so then people go, well, why does that matter? Well, it's basically as your shoulder and your hips start to rotate, your body has to has to spin this long arm. Like your arm is essentially longer. It's a longer lever. Versus when your elbow is bent at 90 degrees or slightly inside, your body's really only have to, only has to accelerate the distance between your shoulder and your elbow, right? That's like 12 inches. So you're yep. basically accelerating. It's like you're swinging a 12 inch bat, which you could swing much faster than a 30 inch bat, right? So it's basically just it's 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 leverages and and physics. And so I think we're, I mean everyone's I think on the same page with most of that stuff. But you know, as a young kid growing up, you don't have any awareness of that. And like you right. said, when your arm goes down through its circle or its its path whatever you want to call it it doesn't have to straighten out because when it straightens out it then has to rebend itself to get into that 90 degree angle so then you ask yourself why should i straighten my arm just to bend it again later right. and that's and that's kind of the thing with with joe kelly like if you look at old video of him and there's video of him from like the minor leagues too his arm was like this super long like dead straight all the way until he bends it when it's time to throw the ball and then you're, it's right to say, well, why do we need that? And then when you watch infielders, their elbows never straighten out. They take nope. it out of their glove, same thing with catchers, and their hand goes down a little bit, the elbow pulls back, and by the elbow pulling back when you've got a little bit of bend, that gets you to that 90-degree angle with your arm like slightly above parallel with the ground, and then they throw it. So when you watch like the catcher or the infielder throw, that's kind of like the purest way to throw, <laughs> to throw a ball really well. And then when you have a pitcher, they like add this extra stuff into it, which you like kind of need, but then you kind of don't need. And it's kind of figuring out, like you said, which pitchers can thrive with a longer arm action and which ones thrive with a shorter one, like Joe Kelly does now. And you're right, it's 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 just a really fascinating thing. But you haven't seen 
almost <clears throat> any big leaguers change as much as he has. Like he went from really I, long to really. Is, what's the term for him? Do they don't they call him like pocket whipping stick or something? I, I think that. I don't know. You I never heard, heard that. You haven't heard that. No. That's no, but that's that makes what, sense. Yeah, because he basically <laughs> just takes the ball to his pocket, he whips it, and then the catcher sticks it, <laughs> which is yeah. pretty funny. Hey, but, listen, you know, and, and you know, Dan, I I would just say, you know, listen, you know it. There's no one way to do this, and 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 that's the one thing that. You know, we we get wrapped up in in, ba- in baseball. Sometimes we're all guilty of, hey, you got to do it this way. You got to, no way. You do it the way that works for you because, at the end of the day, no matter what you and I say to a kid or a young pitcher, that kid that kid's still going to do it the way he thinks it's got to be done because he's the one. It's his stats. It's his career, and it's and it's him doing the motion. So you know, I just think it's. May, at a young age, making the kids aware that hey, you 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 gotta you gotta work through this, and that's why I say throw a football, throw a softball. Just you'll figure it out along the way. Build around your arm, build your lower half. You know, build your strength from your lower half, and that arm's gonna go along for the ride. And we can't control what happens anyways. But I'll tell you what, whether you're long arming it or short arming it, if you're commanding the baseball, I think you're probably in a pretty good spot. You know. Yeah, and there were two really good examples that I would bring up. One of them doesn't – he's not really valid anymore because no one remembers who he was. But do you remember Danny Danny Baez played for the Orioles for a oh, while? Oh, yeah. He had, yeah. The, he had a yeah. super short arm action, just like yep. out of the glove, right to the top, and almost like stopped. Yep. And then yep. it was just 96 coming at you. And he threw yeah. 96 when 96 wasn't popular. Right, <laughs> you, and you it, was easy. it was easy 96. Yeah. Easy, like that. Yeah, that's yeah, a so great you, example. You look at him and you're like, well, is he wrong? And you're like – definitely he's not he's not wrong like no. that works for him and then the other one recently was uh jason mott and he was a former catcher mm-hmm. so that like yeah, all made s- yeah like that all made sense and so then you know when parents are asking like yeah i think my my kid's short arming it what do you think i just go back to like when like you said when you, his stride foot touches down is his arm at 90 degree is that at a 90 degree or slightly less angle and uh you know, those are the two, those are two big milestones. And if they are, what comes prior doesn't necessarily matter that much because they have to get right. to that spot and how they get there. Got to get there. Yeah. It doesn't, doesn't necessarily matter that much. So it's uh, well, like, like a hitter, right? Same thing like a hitter. It doesn't matter how you get. Remember Kevin Euclid and yeah, I mean, even <laughs> yeah. yeah Kyle, but how about Jeter? I mean, if you go back and look at Jeter, Jeter stood with his hands up by his head. I mean, can you imagine if when Jeter was playing Little League Baseball as a kid, if someone said, hey, Derek, you can't hit like that. You got to bring your hands down. Like, he might not be Derek Jeter that we know. I mean, so someone allowed him to be himself, whether it was his dad or his coach in Little League at a young age. Whoever it was, they, they allowed him to be him. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, maybe it's because the older I get, maybe I, <laughs> I'm not as thick-headed anymore. But I just try to, I try to you know, I think about, allowing the athlete to be the athlete and, and being athletic. And, you know, I, I know, believe me, when the Indians talk about drafting guys, they want athletes, you know, they want guys that are athletic. Yeah. Um, you know, so. Yeah. And, and two notes but, on yeah. that is, and that was the other thing Brian Bannister mentioned. He's like, Joe Kelly's the most athletic guy on the team. Yep. And that's yeah, like with a team with like, NFL? wait, say that again. Wasn't wasn't his dad uh wasn't his dad in the NFL with the Chargers or something like that? Wasn't yeah, yeah I, mean, I feel like something like that. Yeah. And this yep. is a team with Mookie Betts with yeah. like uh who else? Who's there? Uh, Jackie Bradley Jr. That is not Bradley an unathletic Jr. team. Like it's not easy no. to win to win that, but he's like it's not even close. He's like he can just like yep. jump like forty inches like whenever he wants. Like he's just crazy athletic. And uh and another good example of what you just mentioned is uh like Jake Arietta's story. Like, obviously, mm-hmm. he always had stuff, right? Like, at TCU, when he was drafted, like, he was just – everything was nasty. But the Orioles didn't really seem to let him be himself. And when he went to the Cubs, like, he went from a 6.5 – like, he was, like, the worst pitcher ever over his first four years in the majors. He just, like, yep. couldn't get it to work. Then he goes to the Cubs, and suddenly he's allowed to, like, stride way across his body. He's just allowed to do what his body knew how to do. And he was unbelievable. I mean, he's still amazingly good, right? And so you see those where it's just trying to – and you're probably the same way as a player. Like, at the end of the day, you just want to be the best version of yourself, right? And you know yourself. You know Dave Swanson better than anyone else. Right. And sometimes right. someone else might tell you that this is the way Swanee needs to be. 
but in your heart, <laughs> Swanee, Swanee knows Swanee, right? Right. Well, you know what, Dan, I'll tell you, and I, I think what's great about our, the professional game today, and I think it's trickling down, professional baseball today, they're allowing the player to be the player more so than ever. If you, if you want to have three different deliveries and you can control every delivery, then do it. If you want to, like, you want to come, if you're a high school draft and you throw a, a splitty, well, yeah, they may want you to develop your changeup and your curveball, but they're, they're more apt to allow you to throw that splitty or fork ball today than when I was coming up. Came up, I was drafted and I was a split finger. I, I threw a fork ball in high school. That was removed from my arsenal immediately. And I had no say in it. Yeah. Players today have a say, you know, and I, I think it's good. I really do. I think it's good because they're taking onus of their own career. Um, and, I, and I love how professional baseball organizations are allowing that. You know, they're allowing the player to, hey, I got a say in my career here. You know, it's not just a, a dictatorship where we all have to do it the same way. I mean, um, I mean, I promote even with my son. He's only 10, but he's, he, he does the Johnny Cueto delivery. He does, he does the Jimmy and the turn. And I totally, I'm, I'm just like so for it. And I, I'm like, you know, I, I want him to do that because you're just promoting athleticism. You're, you're promoting the ability to not be one way, you know? And, and, uh, and, and I tell that to all the kids, how about, how about like what um, Adam Wainwright does? I mean, we had a game two years ago, Dan, uh, uh, John, John J. J. So was leading off for the pirates and Wainwright's on the mound. First pitch of the game, he kept his hands at his waistline. Second pitch of the game, he took his hands over his head. Third pitch of the game, hands back at the waistline with a pause at the top of his delivery before going. So, like, it was, it was three different deliveries to John Jaso in the first three pitches of the game. And we went to replay with it. Like, I texted Jessica in the middle of the, uh, you know, in the middle of the inning, and I'm like, Jess. Wainwright just did three different deliveries and she's texted back. She goes, we gotta, we gotta get that on air. And we did. Well, well you know, but, but this is, this is Ad, that's Adam Wainwright. You know, he's kind of what he and Johnny Cueto, they kind of got this initiated, you know, Hey, let's, let's not feel like we just have to have one delivery. And how, what does that do to a hitter? The, the hitter thinks he's seeing three different guys right now, you know, three different deliveries all within, you know, so me personally, I, I, I promote that. I, I, think, I think it only disrupts the hitter's timing and his ability to keen in on you. That's, but that's just one opinion. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting to see guys like that reinvent themselves because Wainwright, like mm -hmm. my first memory of him was when he like threw the, a curveball that broke right down the middle of the plate to end the World Series when he was like a young guy closing it out for the Cardinals. And he was throwing hard yep. back then. He was like a 94 to 96 guy, I think, with that nasty yep. curveball. And now today yep. he's 88 to 89, right? And he has to evolve to stay successful. Right. And so you see guys do that stuff. And I think it's underappreciated. And sure, not many, like maybe many rookies could do that. Like maybe they couldn't handle the Cueto, you know, spins and, and tempo changes. But when they've been around and they need to find a way to succeed, just like with Tom Glavin and stories about him never pitching inside until uh, who was it who, who, um, God, that was a recent when I heard that story. But was it, was, was it when he was met? Yeah, when he was encouraged to pitch inside, and how that was going to make everything that he did better because he was known as like he's not going to come inside you, and just reinventing right. himself inside changeups from Tom Glavin, like all this right. stuff that they never saw because the scouting report is so vast and like they've got the book on everybody, like everyone knows everything everyone does. So it's like, how do you yep. combat that? Yeah, yeah, and he and he and he had to reinvent because that's what, remember the strike zone used to be so huge, which allowed, and, and then when they started fixing that, then guys like him and Maddox, they had to start coming inside more and, and coming in on that, on that plate more often. <laughs> yeah. But, but he, but he did it, but they did it. They adapted. Yeah. So and it's, yeah, I think there's so much of that stuff that you hear about behind the scenes. Like uh, someone was telling me like in spring training, that the big leaguers just they'll just screw with each other in spring training just so they don't have I can't remember it was like a story like one guy threw like nine straight sliders this is a, a mm -hmm. big league pitcher throwing like nine mm -hmm. straight sliders to a guy during spring training even though he had no intention of throwing him a single slider like all season but he just right. wanted to throw him nine straight sliders so that when the season came he just like wouldn't know it was gonna go on 
Like, right. Yeah, they do that. Just Maddox, like, Maddox was like known for that stuff. Maddox would do that all the time. You remember, I don't know if you remember, I mean, because you're, you're a lot younger, but I don't know if you remember, like Greg Maddox, used to, his spring trainings used to be like, they weren't terrible, but his spring trainings, oh, Maddox went three innings today and gave up six runs on 10 hits. I mean, people are like, oh my gosh, he's not good anymore. No, he's just out there getting his work done and he's doing what you probably just said, Dan. He's letting you think that he's no good. I then, actually think that story was about him now that I think about it. It probably was because he's yeah. known for And then game one of the season, he throws eight innings, uh, 83 pitches in about an hour and 15 <laughs> minutes, yeah. and, and and nobody can square him up. Uh, yeah, there's just Great so game. much, so much. Uh, yeah, and that's that's the stuff I miss. And as we kind of wrap up here, I'd like to hear what you miss most about, about your playing days. But just hearing some of that stuff and just being around guys who do all these crazy, like, high-level things that you're like, wow, like, you just blew my mind. Like, I didn't know anyone did that. And you've been doing that behind the scenes for, like, how long? Like that's right. I never even thought about that. Like what, what, what? Uh, as we close here, I'd like to hear like what you miss about playing. Cause I know you're farther removed than I am, but I'm sure you still have like little dreams and like itches where you're just like, ah, oh, I just. And uh, what you think? How how I don't know what what final advice you might give to a parent or a young coach or a player who maybe is listening to this this episode. Well, I mean, I, I think as far as – put it this way, Dan. Yeah, I don't think – it, it doesn't – I'm 46. I could be 96, and I'm still going to want to play. I mean, I, I I miss being around the guys. I, I miss, you know, they're, they're, you know, even even the, the nasty bus trips that might last 13 hours, I miss them. Um, and I'll always miss them. Um, like I said, just the smell of the baseball field, walking into your locker room and just being around guys that are all highly motivated for one goal. But at the same time – doing it together. And, you know, I guess if there, I guess there's so many different things that I've said to parents and, and would, would continue to say to parents, but I would just continue to, for the parents, enjoy it. We are in such a fast paced, I want it now. This has got to be the way it's just, listen, I'm not going to tell anybody how many teams their kids should be on. That's not my job, but you know what? I would just say to a parent, just sit back get your lounge chair out and go watch your son or your daughter play a game for an hour and a half and enjoy it because this stuff flies by man. before you know it, they're, they're 18 years old. So I would just, you know, say enjoy it, be as positive as you can. You know, Carol Dweck, she's, a, she's written some, written some good books, Stanford. Uh, you know, we, we, we kind of read a lot of stuff with her when I was with the Indians. She's all about the growth mindset. You know, there's a growth mindset and a fixed mindset. She talked about the growth mindset and it really makes sense. And I'm not even a big reader. It's just, you read some of her stuff and you're like, oh man, yep, that's me. I better change the way I think. So, and, um, you know, just be positive and don't ever let, you know, oh, I always tell the kids, you're going to have to have more energy than me. And I would just say as a parent that's involved in coaching, have energy maintain your energy even though you have long days at work come with energy be positive and, and just make it fun we try to end every single one of our practices with a wiffle ball game that might last 10 minutes or some kind of competition because it's it's going to be the last thing these kids take home with them and you definitely don't want them going home saying oh my gosh we were doing these situations and it that practice ended it was dark. shut it down the last 10 minutes I don't care if you whip out the kickball and play kickball for 10 minutes. Like that stuff is done in professional baseball, believe it or not, because of the stress level of the game. So, you know, make it fun, make, 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 make it fun and uh, enjoy it. But yeah, I guess I would just say, I just miss being around the guys. I miss the relationships. Um, and yeah, just like you, man, I wish I can get out there right now and play, <laughs> but, yeah. but Dan, I, I really appreciate you having me on. Yeah, this was an awesome talk. I appreciate your insight. I mean, you, like I said, you've worn so many hats and you've been around so many different people, you know, working with kids, working with famous uh, ESPN broadcasters. And I mean, you've just done so many different things. It's it's great to have your your uh, your experience and your opinion here on the show. So, um, Dave, where can we find you on the interwebs? If people want to follow you or follow up with you, where can they do it? Yeah, well, Twitter. You know, you're right. I'm not a I'm not a big social media guy, but um, Twitter. The Twitter uh, right now it's Swanson B Ball. So I'm at at Swanson B Ball, and on Twitter. And then uh, right now we're 
we're working on <laughs> uh, we're working on the Facebook page. <laughs> I've been I've been against for forever, but too many people are telling me, "Hey, man, you got to have you just got to have you got to have it." So we're uh, we're not there yet with the Facebook, and then our website our website is being re redone. So I had one before I left to go with the Indians, took it down. So right now the best place would be Twitter, um, you know, and um, okay. You know, so I I really appreciate you having me on, Dan. Yeah, so we'll put Dave's uh, we'll put his Twitter link in the episode description, and I'll flash it here on if you're watching here or listening here on YouTube, I'll uh, I'll put it up on the screen so you can uh, definitely follow him. And I've heard Dave might share some of his reports and some of the the stuff that he's doing. So that'd be very cool if that ends up happening. Um, mm-hmm. But at the very least, awesome talk today, and I, I really appreciate you having uh, er, and I really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you, Dan. Have a hey, have a great day, and I look forward to speaking with you soon. All right. Well, that wraps it up for this episode. One of my favorite talks, I think, I've of, of the entire podcast. We're almost seventy episodes deep today, and you can just you can just hear the passion uh, for the game, just for all aspects of it. Just just really spill out of Dave. He's been around everywhere and just continues to evolve and, and continues, like he said, he's mentioned a number of times that growth mindset. And I think when you when you look at people who end up achieving a lot, who end up impacting a lot of people's lives, they always seem to have that same that growth mindset that they always want to keep learning. They always want to keep finding new ways to get better. And uh, like I said, I think if, if you took one thing away uh, from the talk here with Swanee today is that, you know, being open to change and new ways of doing things and not being stuck in that closed mindset, but instead of having that open growth mindset, I think that ends up paying dividends for everyone in the end. So be sure to follow up with Dave on Twitter at Swanson B-Ball. Again, I'll put that in the show notes so you can just click right through. And if you want to follow up with me, I'm at Coach Dan Blewett on social media. That's B-L-E-W-E-T-T. As you know, we're going to have more great guests like Swanee in the upcoming weeks. So if you enjoyed this podcast episode today, be sure to share it with somebody so they can be tuned in because I'm just going to continue to have more and more people like Dave who've got industry experience, who've been around, who have that open mindset where they're trying to just help you learn more about the game and help other people navigate some of the struggles that they had themselves. So if we can help others avoid our mistakes, you know, the game's going to continue to evolve for the better. All right, so thanks so much, and we will see you here next week on Dear Baseball Gods.